On the island of Madeira, vines from Burgundy were planted and still serve as the primary industry to this day. In 1435, Portuguese sailors passed Cape Bojador, and in 1441 they discovered Cape Branco. Two years later, Nuno Tristão reached and passed Cape Verde, revealing for the first time that the African coast trended eastward. By this time, Prince Henry's men had become acquainted with the natives along the shore, and over one thousand of them had been brought back and distributed among the Portuguese nobles as pages and attendants. In 1455, a Venetian named Alves Cadamosto undertook a voyage even farther south for trade, with the prince supplying the capital and covenanting for half profits on results. They reached the mouth of the Gambia, but found the natives hostile. Here, for the first time, European navigators lost sight of the Pole Star and saw the brilliant constellation of the Southern Cross. The last discovery made during Prince Henry's life was that of the Cape Verde Islands, by one of his captains, Diogo Gomez, in 1460, the very year of his death. As the successive discoveries were made, they were recorded by the prince's cartographers on Portulanos. Just before his death, the King of Portugal sent details of all discoveries up to that time to a Venetian monk, Fra Mauro, to be recorded on a Mappa Mundi, a copy of which still exists. The impulse given by Prince Henry's patient investigation of the African coast continued long after his death. In 1471, Fernando de Pou discovered the island that now bears his name, while in the same year, Pedro Descobar crossed the equator. Wherever the Portuguese investigators landed, they left marks of their presence. At first, they erected crosses, then carved Prince Henry's motto, Talent de Bienfaire, on trees, and finally, they adopted the method of erecting stone pillars surmounted by a cross, and inscribed with the king's arms and name. These pillars were called Padreos. In 1484, Diego Cam, a knight of the king's household, set up one of these pillars at the mouth of a large river, which he therefore called the Rio do Padrão. It was called by the natives the Zaire, and is now known as the River Congo. Diego Cam embarked on this expedition alongside Martin Behem of Nuremberg, whose globe is renowned in geographical history as the final record of the older views. In the meantime, one of the envoys of the native kings who visited the Portuguese court provided information that a great Christian king resided far to the east of the countries previously discovered. This brought to mind the medieval tradition of Prester John, and so the Portuguese decided to make a double attempt, both by sea and by land, to reach this monarch. By sea, the king dispatched two vessels under the command of Bartholomew Diaz, while by land he sent two men familiar with Arabic, Pedro de Covilham and Afonso de Paiba, in the following year. Covilham reached Aden and then sailed to Calicut, becoming the first Portuguese to navigate the Indian Ocean. He then returned to Sofala and learned of the Island of the Moon, now known as Madagascar. With this information he returned to Cairo, where he found ambassadors from Joao, two Jews, Abraham of Beja, and Joseph of Lamejo. He sent them back with the information that ships sailing down the coast of Guinea would surely reach the end of Africa, and when they arrived in the Eastern Ocean, they should ask for Sofala and the Island of the Moon. Meanwhile, Covilham returned to the Red Sea and made his way into Abyssinia, where he settled down and transmitted information to Portugal from time to time, providing Europeans with their first notions of Abyssinia. The voyage by land in search of Prester John had been entirely successful, while information had also been obtained that gave certain hopes of the voyage by sea. This had been almost as successful, for Diaz had rounded the cape now known as the Cape of Good Hope, but which he proposed calling Cabo Tormentoso, or Stormy Cape. King Joao, however, recognizing that Diaz's voyage had put the seal upon the expectations with which Prince Henry had started his series of explorations seventy years before, gave it the more auspicious name by which it is now known. For reasons not fully explained, nearly a decade passed without any further attempt to fulfill Prince Henry's plan of reaching India by sea. During this time, Columbus departed Portugal after the king tried to reach India without his help. As a result, Columbus successfully discovered a western route to the Indies, while working for the Catholic monarchs of Spain in 1492. This achievement naturally discouraged any attempts to reach India by the longer and more difficult route of coasting along Africa, which Prince Henry had underestimated. Three years after Columbus's discovery, King Joao passed away, and his son and successor, Emmanuel, did not pursue the traditional Portuguese method of reaching India until the third year of his reign. By this time, 
Columbus's second voyage had revealed more difficulties in reaching the Indies by his method than anticipated. The following year, in 1496, King Emmanuel decided to return to the older method and commissioned Vasco da Gama, a gentleman of his court, to attempt the eastward route to India with three vessels and about sixty men. Columbus's bold venture into the unknown seas had encouraged similar boldness in others, and instead of coasting down the entire western coast of Africa, da Gama steered directly for the Cape Verde Islands and then out into the ocean until he reached the Bay of St. Helena, just north of the Cape of Good Hope. For a time, he struggled to round the Cape due to the strong southeasterly winds that blow there continually during the summer season. Eventually, he began coasting along the eastern shores of Africa, landing his sailors at suitable spots to inquire about Covalum and the court of Prester John. In his quest for a sea route to India, Vasco da Gama encountered fierce resistance from the Moors inhabiting the ports of Mozambique, Kiloa, and Mombasa. These fanatics, upon discovering that their visitors were Christians, attempted to destroy them and refused to provide pilots for further voyages. It wasn't until he reached Melinda that Gama was able to secure provisions and a pilot, Malamo Kana, an Indian from Guzarat, who knew the way to Calicut. With Kana's guidance, Gama's fleet reached Calicut in just twenty-three days. However, the Zamorin, or Sea King, was not welcoming to the Christian visitors. The Muslim traders of the area recognized the threat that the Portuguese posed to their monopoly of the eastern trade and portrayed Gama and his men as mere pirates. Despite this, Gamma's firm behavior allowed him to avoid the schemes of his rivals and convinced the Zamorin to consider an alliance with the Portuguese king. Satisfied with this outcome, Gamma returned to Lisbon in September 1499 after spending two years on the voyage. King Emmanuel received him warmly and appointed him Admiral of the Indies. The significance of Gamma's voyage was not lost on those whose trade monopoly it threatened, such as the Venetians and the Sultan of Egypt. The Venetian chronicler Priuli reported that upon hearing the news, the whole city of Venice was greatly affected and many considered it the worst news ever received. This was not unfounded, as it foretold the downfall of the Venetian Empire. The Sultan of Egypt was equally alarmed, as his greatest source of wealth came from the five percent duty he levied on all merchandise entering his dominions and ten percent on all goods exported from them. Previously, there had been conflicts between Venice and Egypt, but this common danger brought them together. The Sultan conveyed to Venice the necessity for joint action to repel the new commerce, but Egypt lacked a navy and suitable wood for shipbuilding. The Venetians went to great lengths to transport wood to Cairo, which was then transported by camels to Suez, where a small fleet was assembled to attack the Portuguese on their next voyage to the Indian Ocean. In the meantime, the Portuguese followed up Vasco da Gama's expedition with an even more significant attempt. In 1500, the king dispatched thirteen ships, led by Pedro Álvarez Cabral, accompanied by Franciscans to convert and twelve hundred soldiers to intimidate the Muslims of the Indian Ocean. He charted a course even further west than Vasco da Gama, and when he arrived at seventeen degrees south of the equator, he discovered land that he claimed in the name of Portugal, and named Santa Cruz. The actual cross he erected on this occasion is still preserved in Brazil, as Cabral had landed on the land now known by that name. It is true that one of Columbus's companions, Pinzon, had already landed on the coast of Brazil before Cabral, but it is clear from his experience that, even without Columbus, the Portuguese would have discovered the New World sooner or later. However, it should be noted that in stating this, as all historians do, they overlook the fact that, without Columbus, sailors would have continued to follow the old course of coasting along the shore, and would never have left the old world. Cabral lost several ships and many men, and despite bringing home a rich cargo, was not considered successful. Vasco da Gama was once again dispatched with a large fleet in 1502, with which he conquered the Zamorin of Calicut and obtained valuable treasures. Portuguese navigators discovered the islands of St. Helena, Ascension, Seychelles, Socotra, Tristan da Cunha, the Maldives, and Madagascar in subsequent voyages. In the days of King Emmanuel, the Venetian way of colonizing was all the rage. It involved sending a vice-doge to each colony for two years. During that time, their job was to promote trade and collect tribute. Emmanuel followed this method and appointed a viceroy for his eastern trade. In 1505, Almeida settled in Ceylon to monopolize the cinnamon trade there. But the most significant of Emmanuel's viceroys was Afonso de Albuquerque. He captured Goa, 
a crucial post on the Indian mainland that still belongs to Portugal. He also seized the port of Ormuz, which was one of the main centres of the eastern trade. However, his greatest achievement was capturing the Moluccas, also known as the Spice Islands, in 1511. The Portuguese discovered them after taking Malacca. By 1521, they had complete control of the Spice Islands, giving them a monopoly on condiment trade. As a result, prices in European markets rose. For example, pepper, which had cost about 17 cents a pound at the end of the 15th century, now averaged 25 cents. The price of most food ingredients that made meals more flavorful rose as well. One of the reasons the Portuguese monopoly was successful was the Turks' seizure of Egypt in 1521 under Selim. This disrupted the traditional trade route through Alexandria. The Moluccas provided easy access to China, and ultimately Japan. For a while the Portuguese had a monopoly on the eastern trade, which Europe relied on for most of its luxuries. As we'll see, the Portuguese barely beat their competitors to the Spice Islands. In the same year they took possession of them, Magellan sailed through them on his way around the world. His ship, the Victoria, came within a few hundred miles of the islands. In the Annals of World Discovery, the year 1521 stands out as a momentous one. Both the Spanish and Portuguese, who had sought to reach the Indies by travelling eastward and westward, finally arrived at their desired destination, the Spice Islands. This same year also saw the closure of Egypt to commerce, which proved advantageous for the Portuguese, as it diverted trade into their hands. Additionally, the death of King Emmanuel of Portugal, under whose patronage Prince Henry the Navigator's work was completed, marked the end of an era. As soon as news of the New World's discovery reached Europe, the Pope was called upon to determine the respective claims of Spain and Portugal to any lands that might be found. In a bull dated May the 4th, 1493, Alexander VI granted all discoveries to the West, to Spain, with the understanding that all to the East would belong to Portugal. An imaginary line of demarcation was drawn from pole to pole, passing 100 leagues west of the Azores and Cape Verde Islands, which were believed to be in the same meridian at the time. The following year, the Portuguese monarch requested a revision of the line, as it would have excluded him from any discoveries made in the New World. The line of demarcation was then moved 270 leagues westward, or 1,110 miles west of the Cape Verdes. Within six years, Cabral had discovered Brazil, which fell within the area cut off by the revised line. Was this merely a coincidence, or had Cabral been directed to explore this region in order to determine if it fell within Portuguese claims? When the Spice Islands were discovered, it remained to be seen whether they fell within the Spanish or Portuguese sphere of influence. With the inaccurate maps of the time, the islands were found to be very near the line of demarcation, which led to a heated debate between Portuguese and Spanish commissioners who met at Badajoz to determine the matter. In 1529, the fate of the Moluccas hung in the balance. The junta could not come to a decision, but Charles V, in a family compact, relinquished any claim he may have had to the islands to his brother-in-law, the King of Portugal. In exchange, the King of Portugal paid a princely sum of 350,000 gold ducats. The Philippines, however, remained under Spanish control. This transaction had a profound effect on the Indian Ocean, which, for all intents and purposes, became a Portuguese lake throughout the 16th century. The map that precedes this text shows the many trading stations established by the Portuguese along the shores of the ocean. However, this monopoly was not to last. In 1580, the Spanish and Portuguese crowns were united under the rule of Philip II. By the time Portugal regained its independence in 1640, serious competitors had emerged to challenge both Spain and Portugal for control of the eastern trade. Chapter 7. Westward to the Indies, the Spanish Route With a steadfastness that rivaled the Portuguese, the Genoese sailor Christopher Columbus conceived a daring plan to reach the Indies by sailing westward. While the ancient Greeks had long recognized the Earth's roundness and the possibility of reaching India by sailing west, Columbus was inspired by the mysterious islands said to lie far out in the Atlantic, as well as the legend of Atlantis, a utopian land in the Indian Ocean. These ancient ideas were brought back to the forefront of European thought with the invention of printing and the revival of learning, which made Greek masterpieces accessible in Latin. Ptolemy's geography, with maps, was printed in Rome in 1478, and Marco Polo's travels had added to Europe's knowledge of the vast extent of Cathay and the distant islands of Zipangu, Japan, which would greatly reduce the distance between Portugal and farther India. 
Columbus believed that Zipangu was not more than 4,000 miles west of Portugal, and with the misconception that the Azores were much farther off from the coast than they really were, he believed that Father India could be reached after traversing 3,000 miles of the ocean. Born in 1446 to humble parents, Columbus had obtained enough knowledge to study the works of the learned and the ancients in Latin translations. However, he also devoted himself to gaining practical experience in seamanship in his early years. In his time, Portugal was the center of geographical knowledge. After many voyages north and south, Columbus and his brother Bartolomeo settled in Lisbon. Bartolomeo became a mapmaker, while Columbus became a practical seaman. In 1473, Columbus married Felipa Moise, daughter of Bartolomeo Perestrello, an Italian in the service of the King of Portugal and former governor of Madeira. At this time, there was a rumor in Portugal that an Italian philosopher named Toscanelli had put forth views on the possibility of a westward voyage to Cathay or China. The Portuguese king had requested Toscanelli's views through a monk named Martinez, which were given in a letter dated June the 25th, 1474. Columbus had independently heard the rumor and applied to Toscanelli. In Toscanelli's reply, he gave a copy of the letter he had recently written to Martinez. Toscanelli also sent a map showing the probable distance between Spain and Cathay westward in hours or degrees. By adding the information given by Marco Polo to the incorrect views of Ptolemy about the breadth of the inhabited world, Toscanelli reduced the distance from the Azores to 52 degrees or 3,120 miles. Columbus always expressed his indebtedness to Toscanelli's map for his guidance, and depended on it closely for both steering and estimating the distance to be traversed. Unfortunately, the map has been lost, but modern geographers have been able to restore it in some detail from a list of geographical positions with latitude and longitude founded upon it. Certainly, whether he had the idea of reaching the Indies by a westward voyage before or not, Columbus adopted Toscanelli's views with enthusiasm and devoted his whole life henceforth to trying to carry them into operation. He gathered all the information he could about the legendary islands of the Atlantic, the island of St. Brendan, where the Irish saint found happy mortals, and the island of Antilla, imagined by others, with its seven cities. He gathered all the gossip he could hear of mysterious corpses cast ashore on the Canaries, resembling no known race of men in Europe, and of huge canes found on the shores of the same islands, evidently carved by man's skill. Curiously enough, this evidence was logically against the existence of a westward route to the Indies, indicating an unknown race. But to an enthusiastic mind like Columbus's, anything helped to confirm his fixed idea. Besides, he could always reply that these material signs were from the unknown island of Zipangu, which Marco Polo had described as being at some distance from the shores of Cathay. He first approached the king of Portugal, in whose land he was living, and whose traditional policy was directed to maritime exploration. But the Portuguese had been pursuing another method of reaching India for half a century, and were not inclined to take up the novel idea of a stranger, which would traverse their long-continued policy of coasting down Africa. A hearing, however, was given to him, but the report was unfavorable, and Columbus had to turn his eyes elsewhere. There is a tradition that the Portuguese monarch and his advisers thought rather more of Columbus's ideas at first, and attempted secretly to put them into execution. But the pilot to whom they entrusted the proposed voyage lost heart as soon as he lost sight of land, and returned with an adverse verdict on the scheme. It is not known whether Columbus heard of this mean attempt to forestall him, but we find him in 1487 being assisted by the Spanish court. From that time for the next five years, he attempted to induce the Catholic monarchs of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, to allow him to try his novel plan of reaching the Indies. The final operations in expelling the Moors from Spain just then engrossed all their attention and all their capital. Columbus was reduced to despair and was about to give up all hopes of succeeding in Spain when one of the great financiers, a converted Jew named Luis de Santangel, offered to find means for the voyage, and Columbus was recalled. On the 19th of April, 1492, Columbus signed articles with the Spanish monarchs that granted him the titles of Admiral and Viceroy of all the lands he might discover. He also received one-tenth of all the tribute to be derived from them. On Friday, the 3rd of August of that same year, Columbus set sail in three vessels, the Santa Maria, the Pinta, and the Nina, from the port of Palos, first for the Canary Islands. He left the Canary Islands on the 6th of September and steered due west. On the 13th of that month, 
Columbus observed that the needle of the compass pointed due north, which drew attention to the variability of the compass. By the 21st of September, Columbus's men became mutinous and tried to force him to return. He convinced them to continue, and four days later the cry of, Land! Land! was heard, which kept up their spirits for several days. On the 1st of October, large numbers of birds were seen. By that time, Columbus had reckoned that he had gone some 710 leagues from the Canaries, and if Zipangu, Japan, were in the position that Tostanelli's map gave it, he ought to have been in its neighborhood. In those days, it was reckoned that a ship on average could make four knots an hour, dead reckoning, which would give about 100 miles a day. Columbus might, therefore, reckon on passing over the 3,100 miles which he thought intervened between the Azores and Japan in about 33 days. All through the early days of October, his courage was kept up by various signs of the nearness of land birds and branches. On the 11th of October at sunset, they sounded and found bottom. At ten o'clock, Columbus, sitting in the stern of his vessel, saw a light, the first sure sign of land after thirty-five days, and in near enough approximation to Columbus's reckoning to confirm him in the impression that he was approaching the mysterious land of Zipangu. The next morning, they landed on an island called Guanahani by the natives and San Salvador by Columbus. This has been identified as Watling Island. His first inquiry was about the origin of the little plates of gold that he saw in the ears of the natives. They replied that they hailed from the west, which only confirmed Columbus's impression. Steering westward, they reached Cuba and later Haiti, Santo Domingo. Unfortunately, the Santa Maria sank, so Columbus decided to return home after leaving some of his men in a fort in Haiti. The Nina made the return journey even faster than the first, arriving at the Azores. However, severe storms delayed their arrival in Palos until March the 15th, 1493, after a seven-and-a-half-month absence. During that time, everyone thought Columbus and his ships had vanished. The Spaniards welcomed him with great enthusiasm, and after a solemn entry in Barcelona, Columbus presented Ferdinand and Isabella with the gold and curiosities from the islands he had visited. They immediately began preparing a much larger fleet of seven vessels, which departed from Cadiz on September the 25th, 1493. Columbus took a more southerly route, but still reached the islands now known as the West Indies. Upon visiting Haiti, he discovered the fort destroyed and no trace of the men he had left there. For our purposes, it is unnecessary to delve into the miserable squabbles that occurred during his subsequent voyages, which resulted in Columbus's return to Spain in chains and disgrace. It is only necessary to mention that during his third voyage in 1498, he stopped at Trinidad and saw the coast of South America, which he believed to be the region of the terrestrial paradise. Medieval maps placed this paradise at the extreme east of the Old World. Only during his fourth voyage in 1502 did he actually touch the mainland, coasting along the shores of Central America near Panama. After many disappointments, he died on May the 20th, 1506, in Valladolid, still believing, as far as we can tell, that what he had discovered was a westward route to the Indies, despite his proud epitaph indicating otherwise. His mistake is enshrined in the names still in use today to refer to the Windward and Antilles Islands, West Indies, or the Indies reached by the westward route. If they had been the Indies at all, they would have been the most easterly of them. In the days of Columbus, the idea of finding a new route to farther India was not a new one. In fact, Columbus himself borrowed the idea, even in its details, from Toscanelli. However, Columbus's claim to fame is even greater. He was the first to venture into unknown seas without following the coast, and his example led to all the remarkable discoveries that followed. Vasco da Gama and Cabral both departed from the slow coasting route, following Columbus's lead, and were able to fully realize the ideas of Prince Henry. While it had taken nearly a century to reach the Cape of Good Hope by the Portuguese method of coasting, within thirty years of Columbus's first voyage, the whole globe had been circumnavigated. The successors of Columbus sought to clarify what he had discovered. After Columbus's third voyage in 1498, and after Vasco da Gama's successful passage to the Indies, a Spanish gentleman named Hojeda fitted out an expedition with an Italian pilot named Amerigo Vespucci to find a strait to India near Trinidad. They were unsuccessful, but they did land on the north coast of South America, which they called Little Venice, Venezuela, due to certain resemblances. The following year, Cabral discovered Brazil, which fell within the Portuguese sphere of influence as determined by the line of demarcation. However, 
Three months before Cabral's discovery, one of Columbus's companions on his first voyage, Vincenta Yanez Pinzon, had landed on the coast of Brazil, eight degrees south of the line. From there he worked northward, seeking a passage that would lead west to the Indies. He discovered the mouth of the Amazon but lost two of his vessels and returned to Palos in September 1500. In 1500, a great discovery was made by the Portuguese navigator Pedro Álvarez Cabral. He had set sail from Lisbon with a fleet of thirteen ships, bound for the East Indies by way of the Cape of Good Hope. But a storm had driven him far to the west, and when the tempest subsided, he found himself off the coast of a vast and unknown land. This continent lay so far south of the equator that no one had ever suspected its existence. News of this discovery spread quickly, and the King of Portugal sent out Amerigo Vespucci in 1501 to explore this new land and claim it for the crown. Amerigo's mission was to determine how much of this land lay within the Portuguese sphere. He and his companions explored the Brazilian coast from Cape St. Roque to the River La Plata, which lay beyond their reach to the west. They then set out southeastward and reached the island of St. Georgia, 1,200 miles east of Cape Horn. But the cold and the floating ice forced them to turn back, and they returned to Lisbon, having gone farther south than anyone before them. Amerigo's voyage shed new light on Columbus's discovery. Columbus believed that he had found a route to India and had touched upon farther India. But Amerigo and his companions had shown that there was a vast and unknown land between Columbus's discoveries and the Spice Islands of Father India. Amerigo even suggested that this new world constituted a separate continent. A German professor named Martin Waldseemüller, who wrote an introduction to cosmography in 1506, suggested that this new land should be named after Amerigo. And so, the continent we now know as South America was called America, after the analogy of Asia, Africa, and Europe. For a long time this continent was simply known as the New World, and was thought to be joined to the east coast of Asia. But Amerigo's voyage had shown that new lands had been discovered by the western route, and when it was further discovered that this new land was joined not to Asia, but to another continent as large as itself, the two new lands were distinguished as North and South America. It was crystal clear that Amerigo's discovery meant that the only way to reach the Spice Islands in the west was through or around this new world he had found and it was a Portuguese nobleman, Fernão Magalhães, Ferdinand Magellan, who was destined to prove the feasibility of this route. Magellan had served his homeland under Almeida and Albuquerque in the East Indies, and had been present at the capture of Malacca in 1511. From that port he was dispatched by Albuquerque with three ships to visit the Spice Islands, which were famous for their abundance and low prices. They visited Amboina and Banda, and learned enough about the spices of the islands to recognize their importance. But under Albuquerque's guidance, who only sent them out on an exploring mission, they returned to him. However, one of Magellan's closest friends, Francisco Serrao, stayed behind in Ternate and sent glowing reports of the Moluccas to Magellan from time to time. Magellan, in the meantime, returned to Portugal and was employed on an expedition to Morocco. However, he was not treated well by the Portuguese monarch, and decided to leave his service for that of Charles V. He made it a requirement of his joining that he would make no discoveries within the boundaries of the King of Portugal, and do nothing detrimental to his interests. This happened in 1517, and two years passed before Magellan embarked on his famous voyage. He had convinced the Emperor that a strait existed that would lead to the Indian Ocean, past Amerigo's new world, and that the Spice Islands were beyond the line of demarcation and within the Spanish sphere of influence, there is some evidence that Spanish merchant vessels, secretly trading to obtain Brazil wood, had already sighted the strait that would later be named after Magellan. Such a strait is also depicted on Shona's globes dated 1515 and 1520, earlier than Magellan's discovery. By this time, the Portuguese were fully aware of the dangers posed to their monopoly of the spice trade, which had been firmly established thanks to Serrao's presence in Ternate. They did everything in their power to dissuade Charles from allowing the threatened expedition to set sail. They pointed out that they would consider it an unfriendly act if such an expedition were permitted to start. On the 20th of September, 1519, the Emperor persisted with his project, and a fleet of five vessels, the Trinidad, San Antonio, Concepcion, Victoria, and San Diego, manned by a diverse collection of Spaniards, Portuguese, Basques, Genoese, Sicilians, French, Flemings, Germans, Greeks, Neapolitans, Corfiotes, Negroes, Malays, and a single Englishman, 
Master Andrew of Bristol, set sail from Seville on perhaps the most important voyage of discovery ever made. Despite this, the antipathy between the Spanish and Portuguese caused disaffection to break out almost from the start. After the mouth of the La Plata was carefully explored to ascertain whether this was not really the beginning of a passage through the New World, a mutiny broke out on April the 2nd, 1520, in Port St. Julian, where it had been determined to winter. By this time the sailors had become aware that the time of the seasons was reversed in the southern hemisphere. Magellan showed great firmness and skill in dealing with the mutiny. Its chief leaders were either executed or marooned, and on the 8th of October he resumed his voyage. Meanwhile, the habits and customs of the natives had been observed, including their huge height and uncouth foot coverings, for which Magellan gave them the name of Patagonians. Within three days they had arrived at the entrance of the passage which still bears Magellan's name. By this time, one of the ships, the San Diego, had been lost, and it was with only four of his vessels, the Trinidad, the Victoria, the Concepcion, and the San Antonio, that Magellan began his passage. There were many twists and divisions in the strait, and on arriving at one of the partings, Magellan dispatched the San Antonio to explore it while he proceeded with the other three ships along the more direct route. The pilot of the San Antonio had been one of the mutineers, and persuaded the crew to seize this opportunity to turn back altogether. When Magellan arrived at the appointed place of junction, no news could be ascertained of the missing vessel, which went straight back to Portugal. Magellan was determined to press on with his search, even if it meant resorting to eating the leather thongs of the sails. After thirty-eight days, he finally made it through the straits and continued his course through the Pacific Ocean, which he named for its calmness. By chance they only came across two small, uninhabited islands during their entire voyage, despite the fact that we now know the sea is dotted with countless inhabited ones. On March the 6th, 1520, they spotted the Ladrones and were able to obtain much-needed provisions. Unfortunately, scurvy had broken out in its most severe form, and the only Englishman on board died there. From there they sailed to the Philippines, where they were greeted favorably by one of the kings. As a reward, Magellan undertook one of his local quarrels, but was killed in an unequal fight at Mactan on April the 27th, 1521. The three remaining vessels continued on to the Moluccas, but the Concepcion was so unseaworthy that they had to beach and burn her. They reached Borneo, where Juan Sebastian del Cano was appointed captain of the Victoria. Finally, on November the 6th, 1521, they arrived at Tidor, one of the Moluccas, and traded on very advantageous terms with the natives. They filled their holds with the spices and nutmegs for which they had journeyed so far. However, when they attempted to resume their journey homeward, they found that the Trinidad was too unseaworthy to proceed at once. It was decided that the Victoria should start so as to get the East Monsoon, which she did. After the usual journey around the Cape of Good Hope, the Victoria arrived off the Mole of Seville on Monday, September the 8th, 152, almost three years from the date of their departure from Spain. Of the 270 men who had started with the fleet, only 18 returned on the Victoria. According to the ship's reckoning, they had arrived on Sunday, September the 7th, and for some time it was a puzzle to account for the day that was lost.